anyway, so with that being said is that um, I'll be talking about spiritual leadership here this evening. And one of the things that I, I want to, before I even get started, I want to thank Paul and, and Mike in what they talk about, being led by the Spirit, and also Mike's uh, uh, encouragement of how to treat women, right? And so as Mike Ross was talking about his experience in Africa, I had that kind of an experience here in America. I went to, uh, my wife and I, we got married before we knew Jesus. So my interactions with my wife were secular in every way, right? And so I'm the last guy in the room to know anything too, by the way. I'm like, what? <laughs> my wife was attracted to me, she said, because I had no lines, It's exactly what I'm saying. It's like, look, man, look, you like it? <laughs> and, you know, back then I had hair and I looked different. And so I thought uh, I thought I was a catch. <laughs> she really wasn't enamored with me. And so I'm just, uh, it was a little humiliating. But, you know, again, when we were talking about humbling, is that, you know, God, I just shared this with somebody at work, too. As I said, look, one of my favorite passages is this, is when the Lord says this, it's better to fall upon the rock to be br and broken as opposed to rock falling upon you and being crushed in the bug dust, right? And so that's, the bug dust is my part of the, that, that scripture. So anyway, so what happened was this, is we, were, we were up in a conference up in Alaska in the early days, right? And Vince Broussard, some of you might know who he is. Vince had a great impact on our life and especially my relationship with my wife, right? And so we had left the conference and my wife and myself, we got in the car and oh, by the way, little side note. Every one of my stories have a side note. All of this doesn't count for my time. This is just intro stuff, right? So I just want you guys to know this. But anyway, it was the first time that we went and shared a hotel, a hotel with uh, my wife and I were in one room, an old hotel room, and Mike and Randy Gladden were in the next room. And we were up in Alaska, and it's 24, 24 hours of daylight, right? And so we got, in the, we got in the hotel room, and my wife and I got all of our stuff together. We were tired, you know, and stuff. So we, we're getting ready to go to bed, and, and no kidding, man. We're, 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 we're like, is that a plane? Yeah. Whoa, whoa. I'm like, what the? Heck? And I'm looking out the window. I can't see anything. And we laid in bed that night trying to figure out what that noise was. <laughs> Mike Ross. <laughs> Kirk knows what I'm talking about, man. Oh, yeah. I think uh, the story was Kirk went and he, he got another room in the hotel. Yeah. Can't do it, man. And so then Mike does this so that from that the next day, the next day, right? So we, we had this arrangement. So Mike, he does he. He is kind and he is merciful. So he tells Monica and I, he goes, I'll give you 15 minutes. So we had to race into the room, get our stuff together, jump in bed and hope you fall asleep before Mike got in bed. Because he was going to snore and then you were not going to sleep at all that night. Right. So we had we had to work it out. Right. But at that conference, probably one of the most significant things that happened in my life was this a small thing. My wife and I, we leave the conference, we're getting in the car, we're getting ready to leave, and Monica gets in because she was that feminist, you know. And so my wife is independent, she's, and even though we both knew Jesus at this time, we still were operating as two and not one, if that makes sense to you guys. And so we get in the car, and, and I'm in the car, I start the car up, and Vince walks up and he taps on the driver window, right? And he says, and he does those, and I'm like, I don't even know who he is. I'm like, who is this guy? So I seen him at the conference, but I didn't know him yet. I, had never, I, I hadn't even been introduced to him. And so he tells me, he gets, and I get out of the car, and I'm like, what, 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 what? And he goes, you always do that? What? <laughs> he says, you always get in a car like that. And I said, well, the door opens, and you sit in it. <laughs> and he goes, no, you, you don't open up a door, the door for your wife? I'm like, well, she's capable. And he just said this. He said, hey, listen, you don't respect her? Yeah, I do. 
You don't value her. Oh, I, I value her. He said, then open the door for her. I said, well, what? So then I get in the car, and my wife's looking at me. She goes, what did he say? He said, open the door for you. And she goes, I can open the door myself. <laughs> so we're having this conversation as we're going to the restaurant. We're like, and, we're, and she goes, no, you don't have to do that. I'm going, okay, thank you. I, I actually said, I said, I said that's, that, that's weird, right? So anyway, so I said, let's try it. So let's just try it, right? So we go into the restaurant, we come back out, and she goes, I go, wait. And so I opened up the door, and I felt like a fool. I did, and I don't think she felt much better. Now, but I was afraid of Vince. So I said, I said so we're just going to do this, right? Just at least while we're in Alaska, pretend, Right. But here we are now. Fast forward. 38 years later, we've been married for 38 years. We've been together for 41. And my wife does this now when she goes outside to get in the car. She'll. (laughs) And. uh, I in the garage, even when nobody's looking. Something wrong. This is where we're at now. It's part of who we are now. But it was somebody else that actually inputted into our lives a respect or a honor that we ourselves wouldn't have known what to do had that person not injected himself into our life and took leadership into and spiritual leadership in my life and helping me understand this is part of honoring your wife. So it was really one of those things where I was very grateful for. And so to this very day, you know, it's like one of those things. It's like sometimes the little things that we do in life can mean the most to someone. Right. So now I begin. <laughs> you guys are on it, man. All right. So one of the things we talk or one of the things I think of this evening is this, is that we live in a peculiar time. And this last three years, it's gotten really peculiar. If you guys think about it, it's like, man, it's like, what in the world is going on, right? And it's just like, there's a lot of, and, we, and Francis and I were talking about this. And I think, again, it's something that we all know. It's like, look, the elephant in the room is there is an oppression that's out there that seems to be growing every day. If you watch the news, you are subject to fear porn. It's... The world is going to end. It's going to end. It's just inevitable. We've got our uh, um, our president saying there's going to be a food shortage coming. So now people are fearful that, hey, look, here we're going to get starved. So you have all of this stuff going on around us. And it only seems to be building up momentum. Right. And so you, you can almost, in a sense, say this. How do we get where we're at? How did we get here? Well, I'm just going to tell you, I really believe this. It is absolutely critical that the church be the church. I just, I just believe that. I, I believe how we got here is actually the attitude of men will do this. Men will let somebody else do it if they want to. Just like when Paul was saying, they'll do the hard thing. A lot of times what I've seen with men is this. If my wife wants to do it, I'm cool. That's just kind of how it works sometimes. Like, Look, man, you want to take the initiative? Go ahead. I think that's a lot of things. So what happens to us is that we as, when you're thinking about spiritual leadership, you have to take the initiative. You have to want to do the hard thing and realize that you know, if you don't do it, if good men don't do anything, then evil will prevail. I'm just telling you. So then when you think about this, where'd that come from? Well, it's like I think, I think this, again, everything rises and falls on leadership. Could talk about it all day long. Could he actually even explain these things? But I'm going to do an exercise here in just a minute. But remember this, is that societal structure is this. Is that, okay, so do not crack on my drawing. Right? So this is a house, right? And so in our house, when you think about a house, in this case here, I'm I'm not going to get too detailed in it. But here's the thing. Your foundation of your house, your foundation in our country 
Our country is based upon what? All of these things, right? But here, our, 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 every, all of our laws, everything const- is, is developed from the, the Judeo-Christian principles, right? The Constitution, all based on Judeo-Christian principles, right? That's our, it's, if you might say this, I would say in uh, the sake of our discussion here, it's faith. Our faith in God is who we, my, hey, the, in God we trust is on our money, Right? So faith is, is your foundation, right? And then on, on that foundation is family. As the family goes, so goes what? Society. They'll tell you that, right? Then what happens is this, is that what you find from that, that the roof to this equation is this, is fathers. As the father goes, so goes the family. As the family goes, so goes society. Right. And so what you have to look at is this, is that when you're looking at what's going on in the world today, it's an attack on our foundation. Everything is attack on our foundation. When you got when we're talking about transgender, all these things, which is evil. Right. What's that attack on? It's attack on the foundation. It's attack on the family, the breakdown of the family. So, again, what happens to us is this is not just by chance. These things are happening. It's with a methodology that they're happening. To destroy the structure of the family, which destroys society. So we start to think about these. Th- t- what? Ten minutes? Wow. Where'd you get those cards? Okay, so. Wow. Okay, so. Okay, okay you, you put me on. Remember back in the old day, the old phonographs? Seven, eight. Uh, the, uh, I'm, and, amen. Right. <laughs> You guys are going to say, man, Gary's message was the best one of them all. I was like, okay, look. Like, okay, so what happens though is this. The actual, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said this. Now, just kind of looking at it like this. Is that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. He was talking about with Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Remember that? And then, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And what he's talking about this is this. Just think about this. Is that darkness is subject to light, not light to darkness. So when you turn, what happens is this, is that the gates of hell is a stationary position. And the kingdom of God is taken by force and the violent take it, right? So what happens is the kingdom of God is expanding. Even though we may not, the world wants you to think otherwise. However, in God's kingdom, since Christ came to this earth and brought kingdom uh, kingdom principles into this earth, the kingdom of God is ever expanding. And the gates of hell, no matter how much they scream and holler, how, no matter how much they try to swim with the women, it doesn't matter. That's not going to prevail against God's kingdom. Period. So sometimes you get caught. That's what I said. Stop watching media. Stop watching the news because that's not telling you the truth. The truth is in God's word. Right. So I know the end. Of, hey, look, I, I don't care what the gates of hell may present themselves. You know, like the, it's like a toothless lion. My wife said that there was a zoo that was in Canton at one time. Right. And they said that they had a lion. It was a toothless lion. No kidding. And they said at night, what he would do is he roar at night. But he ain't got no teeth. Satan has no teeth. Christ disarmed him on the cross. So he has no power. So he has to pretend like he does. So our exercise here this evening is this, is that when you're thinking about these things, is that I'm going to have, we're going to turn off the lights just for a second, right? And so then I want you to give you a visual aid of God's kingdom, right? So when we turn out the lights, when we turn out the lights there, Philip, it's not sleep time. I'm watching. This is what it's like without Christ. Let's turn the lights back on. And I've given each guy, when you think about God's kingdom, God's kingdom, he's visualizing his kingdom, penetrating every walk of life that we currently experience. Not one area left untouched by the kingdom of God. So I have uh, some gentlemen that I've given uh, the, some cards to. I want you to stand with those right now. All right, now, would each one of you guys, okay, so Philip, who, who do you got right there? God desires to pen, penetrate the world of entertainment. Government. Government. 
God desires governments on his shoulders, right? Religion. Isn't that kind of crazy? We've got to say Jesus was supposed to penetrate religion. Don't we need Jesus in the education system? Don't we need Jesus in family? I'm just telling you right now, the demise of the family. Business. We need Jesus in the businesses, right? Media. We need, oh, we need Jesus in the media, right? You guys can go ahead and be seated. But think about this right now. How does God get into those kingdoms? Or how does he get into those little worlds? It's like you and I. It's like he uses us to penetrate those areas of darkness. And with our influence, he brings about a change in the culture in that area. Your light in darkness. When we, when, we have, when we have Christ in us, we become that light that God desires to penetrate that darkness. And always understand this. When light is turned on, what does the darkness do? It's exactly right. It's kind of like you got anybody ever lived in Florida before? I'm about to throw something at you. I shut her down. Man. Look, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, you lived in, who lived in Florida? Okay, so Mike, we all know about the palmetto bugs. Do you guys, you guys know what palmetto bugs are? Yeah. Flying cockroaches. <laughs> There's big bad boys. They ate, you can feel the breeze when they cruise through the living room. <laughs> they bank, man. I, said, I, I mean, look, they cast a shadow when they fly through. I'm not kidding you, man. Hey, man my, we, were, hey, we were in a place one time. My first time my wife actually, actually experienced a palmetto bug. She actually opened up the shower. Now, anytime we, rent or we go to like a hotel or something like that, she'll... Always go to the bathroom, make sure it's clean. She pulled back the shower curtain, and I heard a thud. And my wife screamed, and she goes, what is that? I came in, I went, oh, man. That palmetto bug was so big, he landed on the shower floor and knocked the wind out of him. He was like, oh, oh. I had to torpedo that guy, man. It's like, man, that, that's a palmetto bug. But one of the things about a palmetto bug was, as soon as you turned the lights on, they scurried. They fled, man, because they were, they, were, they were creatures of the dark, right? But as soon as you hit that light, man, they just scurried to the corners and they got out of it. That's what evil does when light penetrates the darkness. And with spiritual leadership, understanding this as men, understanding everything rises and falls on the fathers, it rises and falls on the men. As men understand their role in society, they begin to embrace it and begin to take back society for Christ's name. So how do you do that real quick? How, I got, how, uh, four minutes? Okay, so, okay, so uh, quickly, all right? One of the things that we do, how you lead, number one thing is this, you pray. As Mike was talking about before, is that my prayer life is actually the number one source of strength in my life. As I pray, I make a difference. You seek God. Seek him, intercede for those that are around you. Intercede on behalf, let him go before you. Because what you're praying for, like again, we're not praying just over our food. What we're praying about is circumstances. If God has placed it upon your heart, there are things that are happening in your life. Start praying about those things. Stop trying to fix them yourself in some cases, but start to pray about those things. Lord, give me a way. And then before you know it, I'm just going to tell you, guaranteed, you guys know this. Most of you at least know this, is that you start praying about something. God will start giving you wisdom about what to do. And in my case, what he does is he starts giving, you know, maybe it potentially gives you a heart for that person that you're praying for. Young guy at work right now. It's like, man, he's going through a situation where, man, he is out there. He's about ready to lose his job. And. I'm like looking at him and go, man, man, dude, you're going to have to pull yourself together. I'm praying Thursday morning. Thursday morning, the Lord just drops in my heart and says, man, you need to start spending time with that guy. I'm like, so I go upstairs. I'm praying in my basement. I go upstairs and tell my wife. I said, man, the Lord told me I need to start spending time with this guy. And my wife starts smiling. She goes, that was a Lord. Because I wanted it to be me. Right. But here's the thing, though. Again, when you start to pray, you start to do these things. I also would say this is that when we think about these, consider others. When you're praying, you need to start considering what Mike was talking about. I'm considering I'm, I'm wondering how can I 
actually be of assistance to them? What can I do to help them? Because it's our good deeds. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Is that right? Right? And so then God will use us to extend that kindness to others. And then whatever perception they might have of who they think God is, you begin to break that perception down through your servanthood. So I'm being kind to I'm just being kind to them. I, I don't, I, with no, no motive in mind, to say, Look, I'm just being kind to you. Hopefully in that, though, they see Christ in me. And the final thing in this case here is this, is that I would say this more than anything else is that we need to be encouraging one another. I'm going to say this and I might get in trouble for this, but I'll say it anyway. There is no gift of sarcasm. I used to be really good at it. Used to think it was. But no. But there is a gift of encouragement. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Is that true? We know our words destroy people. Takes seven positive words to negate one negative. We as men have the power to empower others through our words of encouragement. And one final thing, I'll say this last thing is this, is that I also believe this, a touch is always good too. That's why I believe that COVID was satanic. Is that, you know, look, I do. I mean, it's like, man, look, man, look, man, you, look, you need to be. One of the things that I do with my grandson, I, I intentionally, intentionally touch him all the time. On his head, on his shoulders, my hand is on him, right? Because again, he eats it up. That is a love language for him. It's like that touch where he just absolutely eats that up. Paul, Paul, he's got, he's got to sit next to me. Uh, uh, we were at the Hall of Fame where Jerry's place is at, right? And they had the chairs six feet apart. My grandson, who's seven, we're doing this activity there. We walk in, we're wrapping up the activity, and he sees the chairs six feet apart. That's not going to work for him. He goes, man, he grabs a chair, he slides it over next to another chair, and he goes, Pawpaw, right here. We sit down, man, he's right up next to me. I love it. But what happens, though, just understanding this, understanding this, our true power, the power in the male is being able to just the simple touch of encouragement, word of encouragement, a touch of, of affirmation, these types of things will go further than what you could possibly imagine. God has used you to empower and inspire. It's what, you, what you're created for, others. Men actually are the fuel to the society to, for it to reach its ultimate goal, right? So where am I at? Done? Well, oh, I got a lot to say. <laughs> no, no. I, I, look, listen, Paul and Mike set a good precedent, man. I, I, I got to stay with it. I think I'm pretty close to my 20 minutes. I might have gone a little bit longer, but I appreciate you guys. But again, I just, I, I have, it's like one of those things that I, I'll say this, the final thing I say is this, is that my heart is, is that men would walk in that which they have been designed to walk in. That is my heart, man. And, it's like, and, then, and to realize the full potential that you have and the, the impact that you have on others. Because the bottom line is this, is that when we get that reality in our souls and when we get that reality in our life with Christ, the world cannot stop what God's doing. Uh, even what the Bible talks about, I love this, uh, this last passage, this, this passage, I was, this guy, these are the guys that have turned the world upside down. Right. Wouldn't it be nice if they said, like, man, whenever you're, you're, you're uh, the, uh, the end of your life and they describe it, man, this dude turned the world upside down. That'd be cool if somebody said that about us, right? right? But in Christ, if we're led by the Spirit and walking in that, I really believe that in the world that God has placed you in, it'll turn it upside down. Right? All right. Very good.